Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another live workshop presented here at uh, EA Oshkosh. I'm Mark Force, and I'm Joe Norris, and this is another workshop series that we're presenting uh, on our last day of the Spirit of Aviation Week as we get together with EA together. Joe, we're going to talk about welding today. Yes, absolutely. We're going to talk about one of the tried and true long-time methods of building aircraft. It goes all the way back to the 20s and 30s. Before that, primarily aircraft were basically wood construction for the most part. Yeah. Uh, and then as they developed uh, the techniques, they started uh, using steel tube uh, fuselages and uh, other uh, uh, steel uh, structures. And yeah. They, uh, so welding became part of uh, part of the aircraft building techniques. And of course, all of our early home builds. Uh, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s were primarily welded structures. Yeah, basically steel tube and fabric, right. maybe wooden wings, that exactly. sort of thing. Exactly, and, pl right. and plus all the legacy home builds like that, a lot of times you had to build your own motor mounts yeah. and landing gear, rudder pedals, all that kind of stuff. So that was all uh, with welding, primarily gas welding originally, yeah. and then moving later on into the TIG welding as yeah. well. So there's, there's kind of two paths to welding today. Right. There is a traditional method, oxygen acetylene, mm -hmm. chemical method, gas yep. welding basically gas welding. as we call it, yep. and then TIG welding, which we're using an electric arc to create that heat as compared to mixing the, the oxygen flame, and acetylene yep. together. Exactly, yep. Um, in terms of setting up uh, for your for your build, if you are going to build an aircraft where you need to do some welding or maybe restoration, it's probably more prevalent in restoration today, uh, restoring some of the vintage aircraft, yeah. the steel tube fuselages and, and things like that. So. Um, whereas in the kit world, the kits have developed to a point now where a lot of your standard kits and of course all the equip build kits don't have any welding required at all. Everything comes already welded. Yeah, so that makes it really easy. So you're getting, you know, the, the probably the biggest structure that's the welded structure is the motor mount, right. the engine mount. Mm -hmm. And then uh, depending on what uh, what type of kit you're, you're getting, uh, it might be the fuselage already pre-welded. Right. Uh, so you don't have to deal with that. Exactly. Okay. Uh, as compared to essentially getting a set of plans and then having to go at it yourself. Right, exactly. If you look at all of the uh, early home builds, a lot of the biplanes, the EA biplane yeah. Bells designs, right. uh, you know, the, the Acro Sport, Acro series, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the Pit Specials, all of those legacy home builds that we think about have been around a long time. Those were all traditionally welded up by the builder using sure. a set of plans, building a jig, yeah. uh, doing some tack welding, and then you know forming up the structures and, and welding it. And primarily that was done uh, with oxyacetylene, or what we call gas welding. Sure. Uh, and in, even today, if you were gonna uh, take on that type of project, or maybe you're doing a restoration or something like that, but, but you don't have any welding equipment to start with, the most economical way to get into it from a standpoint of, of money outlay for equipment is still the oxyacetylene uh, system. Sure. You, you're, uh, you have two tanks, you have your, your fuel tank, which is your uh, acetylene, yep. and you have your oxidizer, which is, amazingly enough, oxygen. Yeah. Uh, and those, those uh, cylinders that you get are typically leased or rented. You don't okay. really have to buy them. You can. We can. We can pull up that graphic and it shows a little more detail as you're yeah. going through that. Yeah, so you've got your acetylene cylinder, your oxygen cylinder, those you would, would typically lease or rent from a welding supply sure. store. And then the, the rest of the system you would purchase. Uh, you've got some regulators to control the pressure uh, to, that gets to your torch. Yep. And you've got some hoses and of course you've got the torch itself. And uh, those things are typically purchased. Uh, now, another thing that you could look into, as we've talked about in some of our other workshops, is that some of these types of things, if you have a, a chapter that has a tool crib or maybe some other builders that have used some of this equipment, um, you can uh, maybe borrow this equipment from the chapter or from yeah. another builder. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the neat things about the EA community and especially being, uh, being a part of a local chapter is right. that we share things. We share knowledge, we share tools, we share experience, right. and uh, we share helping hands to right. put things together. Right, yeah. exactly. And uh, the other thing that you can do, uh, you know, EA has a lot of other uh, uh, resources as well. We have our welding book, yes. which uh, we can show you here. Uh, this is a, a compilation of articles that have appeared in Sport Aviation Magazine over the years. It talks Specifically about, for gas talks welding. talks about yeah. gas welding. Mm -hmm. and it goes through every kind of every stage of it. It talks about equipment. It talks about you know lighting the torch, setting up the torch, uh, making sure that uh, you have the proper flame setting, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Sure. And uh, so it's a great, uh, great articles in there. Uh, those articles are also available online. 
uh, yeah, EA Sport, EA Sport Aviation, Aviation is, online, is yeah. uh, archived online. All of the uh, articles, uh, all of the magazines, all the way back to the original magazine, 1953, are all online. That's an amazing resource. Well, I was doing some crazy. research as we were getting ready for the workshops this week, yeah. and I've, I've used it before, but not really in depth as much right. recently. And there's so much stuff. It's yeah, just and there's some incredible. Great, great search functions in there. You can yeah. search for articles. You can search for if you know who wrote an article. You can search yeah. by author. You can search by subject. You great search stuff. The, just the title or the body. I mean, it's just crazy. And there's just tons and tons of information on there. Sure. And of course, we also have our uh, Hints for Home Builders videos. The on-demand on videos on demand that videos we videos offer. On, uh -huh. on the EA website, uh, hundreds and hundreds of videos on there, some of which do relate directly to the welding like we're talking about today. So, yeah. And, uh, and specifically for gas welding, we have a, a, a focused DVD on gas welding uh, 4130 steel tubing, and we also have a DVD, and we'll talk about that a little bit on the TIG welding. Too. Right, exactly. So let's uh, let's, let's take talk, a deep dive into gas let, welding. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about the equipment here. I kind of got started. I talked about the regulators and the hose and the torch, but there's some other stuff you need as well. Yeah. Um, number one, uh, you need to protect your eyes. Yeah, very important. So um, you're going to have to get uh, some uh, goggles. There's several different kinds. We have this type here, which is just kind of a, a, a set of glasses that go over top of your glasses or, or if you're wearing contacts, they, of course. They, uh, they look like sunglasses, but they're more than that. Exactly. The, the, they're specifically shaded to protect from the uh, from the ultraviolet rays of the uh, of the torch uh, flame. And there's different shades. Some people like it a little lighter. Some people like it a little darker. So yeah. there's various different shades you can get, but they're all designed to protect your eyes from yeah, the welding. Yeah, and, and just basically a big set of big uh, set of uh, uh, major sunglasses. And, yeah. and they function kind of like safety glasses too. But the the the, the biggest point is the is the shading, protecting yeah. your eyes from that bright pinpoint of light exactly. that is created by the gas flame. And some people like to go one step further than that. They do make actual goggles that have a, like a rubber frame and then a lens in them, and you you know with a strap around your head, and you can put those, those are kind of the, the the ones you see from yeah. the 1940s. Exactly, but they still have those, and yeah. some people like those. Um, personally, I don't like those as much because my glasses tend to steam up inside sure. of them. So I, I would go with something like this, or my favorite uh, is uh, like a, a face shield where you put a band around your head and you can swivel it sure. up and swivel it down. And they make those, the full face shield is shaded just like these goggles, yeah. and you can get the different shades to, to whatever darkness that you yeah. prefer. And I've used that too. And what, what's nice about this, th that kind of face shield, is it's kind of a pan panoramic kind of view, so you're not kind of like tunnel vision right. through a set of goggles or glasses, you can, your eyes and can look helps, anywhere. That helps sometimes too when you're welding like on a fuselage where you have some unusual uh, positions you need to get into, yeah. and sometimes you can't quite get your head in there, and you, you kind of got to look out of the, out of the side. side of your eye yeah. just a little bit because you really can't get your whole head in, sure. inside a cluster or something, yeah. so those those face shields really, really help helpful. really and well. And you can get those in different shades exactly. too. Exactly, yeah, and they protect your whole face too in case you do get a little pop back or some sparks flying or whatever. Sure. So so they're they're nice. really nice. So you've got several different options on eye protection, okay. but you need to get something, whatever is most comfortable for you. And then we have some other tools here. You need to be able to light your torch. Okay. And, we'll, and, and we you never, can't just never do that with a match. With a match, uh, yeah. You <laughs> want to do that with a spark. Uh, this uh, this is what we call our striker. Okay. And it, it's basically just a spring-loaded handle with a flint and a little uh, sawtooth uh, wheel in there. And uh, if you can see that. As I move that back and forth, sure, the sparks, sparks are flying. And that yeah. spark will will ignite your your gas and get your torch going, which will uh, will do that here in a little bit. Okay. Um, the other thing you need to do, to know is that uh, when you're welding different materials, and we have a couple of, of coupons here showing just some sample welds, and uh, various different thicknesses of material. Gonna, yes. Uh, aircraft is mostly lightweight material, but still there's varying thicknesses. We've got yeah. 30, uh, you know, 35 thousandths, 41 thousandths, whatever it might be. Yep. And depending on the thickness of your material and the type of weld you're doing, you may need more heat or you may need less heat. Sure. So a thicker piece is going to need a lot more heat exactly. as compared to a thin piece. Right. And so you do that primarily by the size <laughs> of the tip you have on your torch. So okay. there's various different sizes of tips. And uh, they have different size of uh, orifice in it to give you a larger flame, a hotter flame, or a smaller flame, okay. depending on the application. And uh, depending on what 
thickness you have, it'll call out a tip, and all that information is given in your, uh, you can get some general information in uh, our welding books or in uh, AC 4313, which is the uh, uh, FAA advisory circular, yeah. uh, acceptable methods, techniques, and practices. There is a section in there on welding. And by the way, if you don't have a copy of AC 4313, make sure you get one, either a printed copy, you can order it from Aircraft Spruce or one of the other suppliers, or you can download it from the FAA website, and you can download it the entire volume, right. or the segments that you're interested Individual in. Individual chapters, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really nice, and, and that's, it's, a, it's a government publication. There's no cost to it's download it. It's about two it. inches thick. Yeah, if, you, so. yeah, if you buy the printed <laughs> version, it'll cost you 20 bucks or so, and, the, and it's a, a tome, basically. Yeah. But it, uh, it's got just amazing information there. I mean, and not just about welding. It's got woodworking. It's got sheet metal. It's got electrical. It's got every facet of yeah. building and maintaining an, uh, an aircraft is in there. Uh, yep. So it's lots and lots of good information. Got to have that, absolutely. So yeah, get a hold of whatever information you need uh, depending on which project you're working sure. on. Sure. So anyway, so we talk about the amount of heat uh, which is done by your tips. Now, the other thing is you need to keep those tips clean. Okay. Because they will carbon up a little bit over time. So when we talk about the tip, the tip is this part right here, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, if we look at the torch, yep. this part is the tip, and that's a, you can actually change those out. They yep. screw in. A couple of then, different ways. We've got a couple of tips here if you want to just unscrew the tip from the, uh, the, the body here. But also, most of the torches, when you buy them, the tip will come uh, already assembled. Okay. And then you can just unscrew just this, this part like this. And then if you need a larger tip, you just put it on the torch. Oh, sure. And Saves a little, little yep, time. Yep. <laughs> and then these are always just hand tight. You never tighten those with a wrench or anything. Okay. Just, they're designed to be hand tightened so that you can easily change them. And you can change the angle, too. If you're right-handed, you might want it angled this way. If you're left-handed, you might want it angled this way. So you can swivel and you can it, basically. Set it, yeah, set it whichever. Some people like to use these torches with the knobs away from them, so they'll angle the torch that way. Yeah. Some people like to use it with the knobs towards them. They'll angle it so you can set Either it way. exactly the way it's most comfortable for you to, to perform the weld. So let's talk uh, uh, about tips a little bit, but then I want to go back to the torch for, sure a, we will. for a second. Sure yep. so we will. When you're, you're selecting a tip, there mm -hmm. are different sizes based on what you're going to weld in terms of the thickness. Right. And exactly. that's basically the little orifice, the little hole yeah, at the end right of it, at the right? Tip, right? Right at the tip, where the gas comes out of the tip, it's a very small orifice there, and that's what they, they number those. And those are uh, dependent on the manufacturer. The numbers may change. Uh, if you have a Smith torch, you might get one set of numbers. If yeah. you have a Harris torch, you might get a different set of numbers. But it all boils down to the size of that orifice. Up on the screen, we have just a quick look at a, a fairly complicated chart, but it just kind of breaks down what yeah. tip size if, you might need based on yep, material. You look at your material thickness and what type of weld you're doing, and then you can go across the chart and figure out which yeah, which, so which brand. pretty straightforward. Yeah. So, and the when you buy your equipment, it'll have a handbook with it that'll talk about that specific make and model of sure. torch and what uh, what uh, yep. what types you do. The torches are are somewhat similar, but they can be different. Um, you'll hear people talk about an aircraft torch. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Is yeah. this an aircraft the, torch this, or something? This else? would probably be considered an aircraft torch. Now, there's nothing aircraft about it except the size. Okay. It's the, when you call the weld shop, they may or may not know what an aircraft torch is, but you're gonna you'd say, I want the small one, and you'll get a smaller body. The, the, the whole body is smaller in diameter, it's shorter. So much it's easier, easier to manipulate. Much easier to get around in tight spaces. Now, okay. if you're doing industrial work or you're gonna weld farm equipment, you might get a, a standard torch, which is probably about 30% or 40% bigger than this. I've seen, they're, they're yeah. huge. Yeah, and, and of course they got cutting heads for them and all kinds of yeah. stuff that you can do, so. That's the kind of torch set that you see if you go like Harbor Freight or yeah, something exactly. like that. Yep. Uh, these huge, big things. And even with the aircraft torches, they'll vary a little bit by um, manufacturer. Like this particular torch has the uh, the little valves up at the top. <laughs> okay. Some of them will have the valves down where the ho uh, by the hose connections. Sure. Doing the same job, just a little bit different uh, yeah. location. Okay. And I find mo more of the small Smaller torches have the valves up at the top, and it makes it really easy to, to, you know, when you're holding the torch, you can manipulate those valves pretty, sure. pretty easily right yep. there. And you might have to make a small adjustment or okay. something. So, so there's your torch. Uh, again, you've got your hoses. The other thing that you'll notice is the hoses are two colors. Red and green. Green and green, yeah. Green, green is your uh, green is your uh, oxidizer, your okay. oxygen, and red is your fuel. Whether it's acetylene or you might be using some other type of fuel. Normally we use acetylene. Mostly acetylene, yeah. But so the, the red is the is the hot stuff, and the, and the green is the oxidizer. And what you'll notice on that is any time that you have a, a fitting, uh, uh, like on your valve here, or on your torch here, the fuel valves are going to be opposite thread. They're going to be left hand thread. 
and the oxidizer. So you can't possibly mix you can't them up. Get them, you can't get them Left up. Left hand, le right hand. Yep, because the, 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 the regulators are totally different. And of course, you don't want to cross that up. So sure. you've got to make sure that your, your regulator for your gas feeds your gas side of your torch and the regulator for your oxygen feeds your oxygen side of the sure. torch. And so as, as I was putting those together uh, earlier, I noticed that on the, uh, the nuts, there actually is a little uh, uh, there's a little, there's a little, there's a little marker on them, yeah, yeah so that, so you that can indicates tell which, which one's fuel and which one's oxidizer. Yeah, with, and, and the fuel one will be left hand thread and the oxidizer will be the right hand thread. Sure. So, uh, so that's kind of the basic setup. Now let me talk a little bit about how we make it work. Yeah. So first thing you're going to do uh, is you're going to kind of walk back. You're going to make sure your torch valves are lightly, you don't want to crank these really hard, but you just lightly shut them. Make sure yeah. they're shut. And that, that's important because they're just really tiny valves in yeah, there. Little, and you don't, if, you, seats, if you get them yeah. too t tight, you, you can, can really just, mess them you up. Can destroy yeah. Them, yeah. So you make sure the torch valves are shut. Then on your regulators, before you turn on anything, you always make sure that your regulator uh, control handle here is backed all the way out so there's no pressure on it because you want sure. those regulators shut off immediately. Uh, to begin with. So just kind of like a big overview, we have the gas tank, in this yep. case the acetylene and yep. then the oxygen, yep. and that is a, a regulator is connected to the tank, right. and the regulator's purpose is to take the higher pressure of the tank right. down to a much, much lower pressure that the torch is capable of using. Correct, yep. That's and exactly that, so right. And that, that, this part makes that happen, yep. and then the gauges here uh, show us tank pressure yep. on the right-hand side as you're looking at it from the, uh, the screen, mm -hmm. and then the left-hand side is, is what is we're the working, regulating. The working yeah. pressure, right. yep. okay. exactly, that's exactly right. So what you want to do is make sure that these are all the way out, nice and loose, so that you know that the regulators are shut, so you're not going to get any flow through the regulator when you first open the tank sure. valve. Sure, okay. We'll just work our way down. Yeah. So a couple of key things to remember. The acetylene is stored in the in the cylinder at a much lower pressure than the oxygen. Okay. And also, you want to operate at much lower pressure. So it's a, so. When and, you, and why is that? Um, ultimately, if you if you let acetylene flow at higher than 15 pounds per square inch, it becomes very unstable, and you could cause an explosion. Oh, really? So wow. you really want to keep that okay. down. And you'll so notice on the on the working side valve, it actually has a red line that starts at. Oh, I see 15. that. Yep. So it'll tell you, hey, don't go up above. Don't go that. beyond that. Yeah. Um, in the tank, it'll be on a full tank. It might be 250 pounds or so, and, and there's a there's a medium in here to to keep that acetylene stable in the tank. So sure. It's okay to have it. Uh, pressurized in the tank, you just don't want it to flow at a high rate. Move around, basically. So, yeah. mm -hmm. and also because it's fuel, it's it's your fire. You yeah. want to make sure you can control that in case you do have a problem. So you never turn this valve on more than about a quarter to a half of a turn. Okay, and that'll give you plenty of flow through the valve. Yep. no problem. So when you crank your valve open, the first thing you'll notice is our tank pressure side comes up to show that we do have pressure sure, in the tank. Sure, so it's come up to and about 250 PSI. Sure enough, PSI. it's about 250. So that tells about, us a pretty full yeah, tank. So we got a pretty full tank, and that one's ready to go. Then we come over to our oxygen. Now, the oxygen's different. The oxygen has a very high pressure in the cylinder. It looks like a scuba tank. Couple, it does, <laughs> but, and it'd be a little heavy for scuba diving. Yeah, I think it, so. It would work, um, but the, 2,000 pounds of pressure or so, maybe even 2,500 That's for a, lot. a very full yeah. tank. Mm -hmm. So the valve is different. The valve is what they call a double seating valve. It, it seats when the valve is closed hmm. so that you don't have any gas escaping from the cylinder. Yeah. But when we open the valve, and there's a jump right up to about 2,100 pounds here, so we got yeah. a pretty full cylinder. Sure. But you want to open this valve all the way until it stops. Ah. And the reason that is is because now you're sealing the valve on the top side so that there's not oxygen escaping around the valve stem because you'd just be losing it. So the it. valve, instead of being like a plunger as we think of a valve, is more like a cylinder exactly. with a seal on both ends. Exactly. Yeah, it's almost like a, a little oblong ball it seals on the bottom when you close it and seals oh. on the top when you open it i so, never knew that yeah. yeah so so we want to open it all the way till it stops because that way it'll it'll save us from losing material out, out through the valve, the valve. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so now and so we've got our pressure there we got our pressure there we're good to go now now we want to set our working pressure okay so the working pressure for a, a, a torch like we're using here is going to be somewhere around five or six psi depending on exactly pretty low tip. not too much very yeah. low yeah mm -hmm. these are small tips small torch don't need a lot of flow. Sure. So what we want to do to set the working pressure though is we want to crack the valve on our torch because we want flow. We don't want it to be captured because you'll get a, a, an abnormal reading. So I'm going to set my acetylene. I'm going to just, just crack this valve a little bit. So when you say crack it, it's just, just opening just it open just a just tiny bit. Just a yeah. tiny bit, yeah. And now I'm going to start to feed my, my pressure up by turning the, the screw in. 
So, which allows the, yeah, the which gas it, to flow. Which, yeah, it starts to open the regulator, allows yeah. the gas to flow, and I'm going to watch here and see when I get about five pounds of flow on that regulated side. And, uh, and you're not going to be able to see that on the screen, but it's coming uh, to you five. Can see, so enough. you need flow, otherwise it's uh, yeah, not going to do anything. Because you'll notice when I shut this off, if you looked real close, you'd see it jumped up to about six. Yep. Because it's captured in there now. Yeah. We want to we want to know what the flowing pressure is, not what the captured pressure sure. is. Sure. So I make sure I'm about five on that, then okay. I close that. Now I'm going to open just slightly my, my oxygen valve, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to crank that regulator in until I get about five pounds of flow on the oxygen side. Okay. Now some of the torches and some of the tips are designed, th this is a, what they call an equal pressure torch, so you want five pounds on each side. Sure. Some torches are not equal pressure, and again, if that you'll know that by reading the manual that comes with your torch. And you'd adjust it accordingly. You, adjust like, it you might have the extra oxygen or yeah. extra acetylene or exactly. vice versa. Exactly, whatever the yeah. torch, but most of our small torches that I've seen that are used in aircraft are always equal pressure sure. torches. So typically that's what you'll run into. <laughs> okay. But read your manual. Yeah. Read the directions. Well, we keep talking about we've that We've been talking about that all week. It's really important to follow the instructions. Yep, exactly. Okay. So now we've got our regulator set for our flow. Okay. We're ready to light the torch. All right. Now, lighting the torch again, as I mentioned, you don't want to use a flame. You want to use a striker. spark. Yep. So what we do, I'm going to open the oxygen a little bit, and that's going to just purge the torch. It'll get um, all of the natural atmosphere out of there and make yep. sure that there's no latent acetylene in there laying in the torch itself. So I'm okay. going to just kind of clear the torch out. Yep. Then I'm going to close my oxygen valve, and I'm going to open the, the acetylene valve just a little bit. Okay. And I'm going to strike my flame. Whoop, I had too much acetylene there. I'm going to purge the torch again. Okay. I'll add it open a little bit. Just open it a little bit to light it. So I'm going to just, just crack it a little bit. Okay, there's our acetylene flame. Now notice how it's very yellow in color. And it's, and it's uh, got a bunch of soot. A lot of, well, soot, a bunch a lot of, of soot carbon coming off of it. Now, I'm not looking at it much because I don't have my goggles on, but I'm yep. going to start adding oxygen really gently here. Now it turns white. Yep. And if you could see that, you can't really see it on the on the camera real well, but if you could look at Actually, that flame. Actually, we've got a pretty good shot of it. If you yeah. look at that flame, you're going to notice there's an, a, a real long outer um, Bluish. Kind of sheath that's blue, yeah. and then there's a, a, a real bright white part, and yeah. then way down in there, there's another like a blue little tip Just in Just a there. tiny little blue, and yeah. And you want to bring that, that white light part, that medium part, down until it joins that blue inner, that real bright blue inner tip there. I'm going to bring up a graphic that yep. we have that kind of shows that. So that's what they call a neutral flame. Uh, your oxygen and acetylene are balanced. Okay, we can go back to that then. Yep. If you go back, I shut the oxygen off, it goes to the yellow, okay. too much acetylene. I bring my oxygen in until I get a nice little cone in the middle of all that, that yellow. Goes away. Yep. And then if I go a lot of oxygen, it gets down a real hissy. So in between there, just before the hissy, yep. there was like a little star point. Yep, and exactly. that's what you're looking that's for? Your, that's your neutral flame. Okay. That's what you want to weld with. Uh, if you got too much acetylene, it's called a carburizing flame, too much carbon. Yep. If you got too much oxygen, it's called an oxidizing flame, too okay. much oxygen. And if you got the balanced flame, it's just what they call a neutral flame. And that's what you use for welding your aircraft. So you always keep your torch adjusted like that. Tip's a little dirty. You can hear it hissing a little yeah, bit. Yeah, a little bit. We'll yeah. talk about cleaning the, the tip sure. here in just a second. And when you want to shut it off, you just shut off your gas. Okay. And it goes out. And then remember to shut off your oxygen so you're not wasting oxygen right. by letting it. And the oxygen is also kind of it, back purging. It back it purges the torch, but like I say, just don't forget to shut it off. <laughs> right, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you're, you're just... going you're to waste a lot of your material, but that's sitting there just gradually flowing sure. out of there. Yep. All right, so I said I had a little bit of a dirty tip. Yeah. How do we clean all for the devices you have. Sure. The other thing you have in here, not only do you have the wires, but you have a, a little, just a real little fine file. And that file is used to just kind of knock the burrs off. You might have some metal stuck to the tip here yep. that maybe you had a pop back or sure. you know, accidentally stuck the torch in the, in the puddle or yeah. something. And you just take that file and you just, just nicely rub it across there and that'll knock off all the slag. And then you find the appropriate size wire for your, for your tip. I'm going to guess this is the one. And you just put the wire in there. That isn't the one. You need a thinner one than that yet. Let's put the wire in the tip if I can see what I'm doing. That one's still too big. Maybe we don't have one small enough in this particular set. But anyway, you would just slide that wire in there and pull it out. Yep. And that serrations will draw out whatever carbon or, or debris you might have in that tip. It's like a really hard pipe cleaner. It, <laughs> it's exactly how it works. It's yeah. exactly how it works. So, and then. When you're all done welding, the only other thing you have to do now is you have to shut the whole thing down. Okay. So now we, again, 
this point, we've just shut off the torque. Yep. Everything, everything else, is, else still is release all the pressure in the system and okay. save our uh, save our materials. So yep. the first thing we'll do is shut our valves off at the tank. Before okay. We do anything else? Shut the valve off there, nice and snug. Crank this one all the way down. Remember, we cranked it all the way open. Yep. Up crank it For all the way oxygen. Down. Uh huh. Now, before we touch the regulators, we're going to open our torch valves and let that whole pressure bleed out of that system. Okay. So I'm going to open my acetylene valve, and you'll see that pressure goes down to zero. Everything's leaking there it out. Goes yep. down there. When, when it pre pressure hits zero and you don't hear any more flow, yep. then you can release your pressure on your regulator so that it's ready to go the next So time. you know that it's totally yep. empty, yeah. Yep. And then I do the same thing on my oxygen side, and what I'll do there is I'll crank the pressure up on the oxygen a little bit so we get more flow and it'll empty the system a little quicker. Sure. And it'll just gradually bleed themselves down to zero. There it goes. There it goes. Mm -hmm. Just getting down there. And then once we hit zero on both of those valves and we don't hear any more flow, can't feel any more flow, mm -hmm. then we know that the system is empty. Sure. And then we can back our regulator off. Okay. There, there it goes. goes. Yep, down and zero. And there it is. There it is, yeah. Back her off, close your valve here, and you're all set to store your torch until the next time you need to weld. Okay. So you just remember, you need your, your torch lighter, you need your cleaner, you need some eye protection, your various size tips that you'd need for, for various thicknesses or, yeah. or, or joint styles. Uh, for example, if you just weld this T-joint like we have here, uh, if you just weld that, it's going to take a different size tip than if you have these same size of the tubing, but you've got like four of them in a cluster. Yeah, because that cluster is going to absorb more heat. This is simple, just yeah. a basic T-joint, but a, a lot of aircraft fuselages and some other things, you have multiple tubes coming into the yep. same intersection. And the more, the more tubes you have in that cluster, the more heat it's going to take to, to get that they're all out sucking Away They're heat. all drawing away heat, yeah. exactly. So and the other thing you have to watch out for is if you're welding a big cluster like that, okay. it's going to keep getting warmer and warmer and hotter and hotter as you go. So you might actually have to back your torch off as you go because you want to pour a lot of heat in there to get it welding, but now it's going to keep getting hotter as you're welding. And it, and it stays somewhat and hot. It, and it stays hot, so you might have to actually throttle your torch back a little bit because otherwise you might end up with too much heat in your weld area. So there's a tremendous there's amount a, of technique, there's a technique involved. There. And, and uh, all that is uh, that knowledge is basically just from practice. Mm -hmm. You're going to start with uh, literally when I start when I start to showing people how to weld, I'll start not even with a joint, but just with a flat sheet of metal, and just have them run a bead down the metal. Just a couple of steel coupons. Not yeah, not even not even welding anything together. Just making them weld puddle and and just kind practicing of the feel melting of, the metal basically. Exactly. Yeah. And once they get real you know, comfortable with that, then you'll take two sheets and put them together in a butt weld and let them weld that. Okay. Okay, that's great. Then you'll give them a T weld like this, mm -hmm. weld that, and then you'll start working on tubing first. Sure. A simple weld like this, and then maybe one with at an angle, and then later on um, a cluster. So we have a little graphic of there's a, a, all different kinds of basic joints. Right. But you start out with the simplest, yep. which is no joint at all. Right. <laughs> just basically the flat sheet. Just a flat sheet. And just yeah. get a feel for how the, uh, the torch is melting, yep. Yep. and get your hand-eye coordination. Exactly. That's, just like it's anything, all, it's all, it's, it it's, yeah. it's all uh, getting things, you know, understanding what happens when you're too close, when you're too right. far away. Right. Having a, a different size torches, yep. maybe different flows, that sort of thing. Yep, exactly. And then you start doing these other things, yep. practicing. Practicing all so, the different so types of welds. And yep. practicing with flat sheets first, yep. and, and then tubes. going into uh, tubes, single tubes, yep. uh, even just no joint at all. Yeah, just weld around. Because the tube. now you're going from a flat surface to this to circular surface. And, and, and that just changes the dynamics of everything. Right, because now you're not just sitting at the bench welding what's in front of you. Now you have to start moving your body. You have to move it around. Torch, and then yeah. that, it kind of gives you a different perspective to work sure. on there, too. So we talked about the torch, but there's yeah. another really important part yeah. that we have you're to not, add to the Right, you're not going to do any welding mix. without a filler rod. Yeah. Because you can't. Well, you can actually just melt the two pieces of metal together, but you end up with a really thin, very weak joint when you do that. Yeah. So you have to add some material as you're melting sure. the, the two pieces you're welding as you're, as you're uh, putting them together. So these are filler rods. Yep. There's many different sizes and yep. materials and shapes. Yep, I've heard of people using coat hangers, although that's not necessarily recommended. <laughs> Probably not on an airplane. If you're doing yeah. farm equipment together and you're in a pinch, it will work. Yeah. Um, the, the filler rod will, there's two things it's going to depend on. Number one, the type of material you're welding together. Okay. 4130 steel, mild steel, aluminum, whatever it sure. might be. And the other thing is the thickness of the material you're welding. Okay. Because you don't use a great big rod on real little thin material. And, you and don't vice use versa. A, you don't use a real thin rod on thick material because 
you want to balance that out. So a nice even thin flow. plate like this, and this is like probably 40 thousandths material, yeah. you're using a rod that's maybe 332 yep. or yep. something 16, like that. 16 or 330. Yeah, seconds. or even 40 thousandths. Yep. We had some tiny rods that we've used yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and th those rods, uh, you know, typically in uh, the, the, the kind of the time honored filler rod to use for 4130 aircraft steel is what they call, used to call Oxweld 7. Well, the Oxweld company isn't there anymore. Sure. But it's still a number seven it's, rod it, that you can buy. It's kind of a moniker it's got, of it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's the one that most people use. There are others that you can use. Uh, We've got a, again, a quick graphic of yeah. just two, two types that are available yeah. commonly. The right. uh, Oxwell, the, the number seven the number rod, seven rod yeah. and then the, I think it's a 23, yep. 23 CMS. And, and again, mm -hmm. um, those are two common ones, but there's other, you there's know. There's others, yeah, and, and your welding manuals and your uh, different references will guide you through what you might want to choose yeah. for a particular weld that okay. you're going to make. So, so you will be, your torch is in one hand, your filler rod is in the other hand, and and you're basically making the puddle with the torch and then feeding the metal in with the filler. So kind of, if you were doing this tube, how would you kind of line things up? Yeah, I would, if I was going to weld. We're not going to do some welding here because we really don't have If the, I was going to weld this tube, I would probably, uh, it'd be tacked together already so okay. it stays put. So when you're tacking it, you're actually doing do little, little tiny bitty, welds. Little bitty spot welds kind of okay. like. You're just melting it. If I was going to tack this, I'd tack it right here at the joint and i just put like a little bitty round weld there just to hold the tubes in place yeah. while I proceed with my full weld. And being left-handed, my torch is in my left hand. Sure. Um, so this is a mirror image of what a right-handed welder would do. Okay. So I would start uh, probably in here. I'd warm this up a little bit with my torch. And so you're doing kind of like a circular yeah, action get it, to kind get, of get it warmed nice and up, tight, and then I'd start nice zero. I'd start zeroing in on where I want to start my yeah. my joint, and I'd get a puddle going, and, a, and the metal will turn like a bright yellow, and then all of a sudden you'll see it start to literally flow. It's going to turn into liquid. Okay. And then at that point, I'd start feeding my filler rod in with my right hand. All right. And again, the right-handed person is just going to have a torch in the right hand, filler rod in the left hand. Uh, and then basically you just work your way around the weld, continually moving that puddle, and as you move the puddle, you keep adding your filler rod. You just kind of dabbing And the technique, in, yeah. the practice technique, is just you get to the point where you know how much filler rod you need to get the proper penetration and not end up with too much metal there. Because that A adds a lot of weight and actually can can make a worse weld than if you put the right amount of metal in okay. there. Okay. So. so you talked about using the tack welding to hold things together, mm -hmm. but there's another method that actually goes beyond that when you're building a fuselage or uh, an empennage mm -hmm. and, and welding it. And you're basically building a jig, kind of like we're d we did with the wood uh, wing right, rib right. is you're building a, a basically a, a plywood platform yeah. and lots of little pieces of wood blocks that yeah. are holding the tubes in place mm -hmm. that do a couple things. It helps you to cut and fit the tubes and make right. sure they're all ready to go, right. but then holds them in place as you're welding. Yeah, right? actually, even, even if I was going to do a jig like that, which I did when I built my home build, um, I would still tack it. So that you, no tubes are going to move ever while you're welding that. Sure. Way. Yeah, but, but but to start out with, yeah. you put it in the jig to get everything lined exactly. up. Exactly. And then yeah. you go around, and then and you start tacking yeah. things. Make your tack welds on all your joints, and then once and the, it's all the tacks tacked. are like an ultimate clamp. Yeah. And ways, then right. and then once you get all your tacks done, then you can actually pull the the like a fuselage side or whatever out of the jig. Sure. And start to form your three dimensional fuselage by adding the cross tubes and yeah. diagonals and all the different sure. things you got to do. Mm -hmm. And then there's ways uh, if you look in the welding uh, manuals or uh, some of our videos, it'll show you ways to hold that all together yep. in place with some wires and turnbuckles and maybe some other jigs that you might make. Get everything nice and lined up. Yeah, just get everything square and lined up the way you or want. You're not talking about really expensive tooling Simple to do stuff. that. I mean, you're talking about clamps. A carpenter and, square and some clamps and yeah. maybe some, some wire and a couple of hardware store yeah. turnbuckles and you're all set. You don't need to get like a laser level and all no. this kind of stuff. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> of course, they didn't have that back then. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, they, Remember, they, they built all of these things back in the day with bubble levels and, and, and snap chalk lines. Right. You know, so and pretty, pretty simple stuff. They're as good as, if not better than some of the things today. Pretty simple stuff. So so that's uh, that's kind of the, the overview of the gas welding side of things. Mm -hmm. Now, as you mentioned, as time has gone on, we've uh, advanced to uh, much more uh, use of electric welding. Yeah. Of course, first it was the old stick arc like you've seen in the movies a lot of times and the ship builders and the bridge yeah. builders and all that stuff. I used those in high school. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, we did too. We had a little welding course yeah. and, you know, you had this big helmet right. and it wasn't anything special and this yep. huge electric machine. Yep. Giant. I mean, it was giant. Sitting, it was just huge. Yeah. On and a, you, on a you cart. Yeah, now look what we have today. This is a, a Lincoln Electric TIG welder here. Very simple uh, piece of equipment. Uh, you, you can pick it up and carry it. 
and you plug it into a regular wall socket. You don't need any special, you know, 220 volt outlet or so anything. So like that's that. one of the game changers because TIG machines back in the day used to be huge. Right. A big, huge transformer machine, yep. and you have to have 220 volts and maybe three phase and all this yeah, kind of crazy right. stuff. Exactly. Now they have uh, designed it with computerized technology right. that you don't have the big transformers. Yep. It's all electronic switching. Yep. You've are able to plug it into literally a 20 amp circuit. A household circuit. Yeah, yeah. although you probably want more than that, but 20 amps you would could, probably yeah. get you going for the, some of the stuff yeah, that we're you doing. Could, you could run it on and that. And, and you could literally weld anywhere with this. Yes. So exactly. we're taking, we're, we're going from the, a chemical system to create heat mm -hmm. to an electric system, exactly. an electric arc. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the other thing that you have, which we don't have here for our demonstration purposes, but the reason it's called TIG, T-I-G, that's actually an acronym, it's tungsten, which is your electrode, mm -hmm. and inert gas. Okay. So in the torch, which we'll talk about in a minute, you actually have a flow of gas around the, the arc to keep it clean. Okay. And that, that yeah. gas is typically argon. Yeah. So you have, we'd have a cylinder of argon. Yeah, and here's the little regulator that goes onto there, and it, uh, yeah, same kind of thing. This it's regulator is a little bit different because it does have a, a gauge to show you. Um, gonna, it does, it over here does so have the gauge to show you what your tank pressure is. Okay. But instead of giving you a working pressure, it's giving you a flow rate. Okay. So you and know, that's what this bubble thing yeah, is. Yeah. How many you know uh, cubic feet per minute or whatever. Yeah. CFM. And this this one it actually this one is designed to use either for argon on this side or carbon dioxide, which is another popular shielding gas. So this regulator would actually work for either one. Okay. And all you're doing is you know you make sure you got pressure in your tank, and then you're turning the adjustment knob until this little silver ball to get the up. flow. Yeah. And that shows you what your flow is, and you know you've got a proper flow to get your shielding. And again, that's right. another thing where you'd look at a chart and figure it out exactly, exactly what the flow. And I'm gonna pull up a, see if I can get a graphic here. So this is. A, a, a larger TIG machine, but it gives you an idea of that argon tank, yep, that shielding right. gas tank. Right. So that's doing nothing but protecting. Yeah, the while, well. while that puddle is liquid, it's uh, keeping all contaminants out of that weld. So yeah. it's just all you've got in there is the electric arc and the argon shielding. So there's no other atmospheric contaminants that might get in yeah. there and, and weaken that weld. So okay. it just protects the weld sure. while it's in the molten form. So let's kind of like do like we did with the gas welding mm -hmm. uh, discussion. We'll start at the torch and kind of work back sure. to the the, uh, the machine the machine or yeah. the, 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 the motivator or whatever you want to call it. Itself, yeah. <laughs> so here's here's a TIG torch we have here and if you want to explain some of the parts. Yeah, uh, interestingly it's called a torch just like our gas torch and that's because the process we're doing is very very similar in okay. the method that we're welding. We're just using electricity for our heat instead of the gas flame. All right. So you're going to hold it just like you did the, uh, the, the gas torch. And if you can see here, right in the very tip is our tungsten electrode. Okay. And that's where so that's... So that's hooked up electrically going through the hose back, back to, the to the machine. machine. Yeah. And we'll talk about the yeah. settings for that. And then around the electrode, you've got this gas cap here, which is uh, uh, kind of a pink color. And that's what's directing that argon flow. Okay. Around the arc to keep, right. keep that uh, well puddle clean. All right. And so, and then back here on the back side of the torch is just a cover. This this tungsten, when it's brand new, is is about as long as my where my finger is. There. Sure. And then as it as it as you weld, it'll wear, and you have to keep resharpening it. Yeah. Sliding it down and retightening it. Okay. And you do that just by loosening the back end of the torch. Sure. Here. It's a little clamping. Yep. Kind yeah, of a, a little, system. Yep. So I'm going to take that off just to show you what that looks like. So oh, yeah. there's your there's your tungsten electrode hiding inside the cover. Sure. And now, if you need to weld in a very very tight uh, location where you can't get this torch in, you can actually get a short cover and you can cut the tungsten off and you can have. So you use a short length of tungsten. Yeah. A short length of uh, that's called the back cap. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you can you can have a short back cap on there to give you better access into your uh, wherever yep. area you're welding. And that not only does it grasp the electro, but like you said, it's sealing that whole system so the shielding gas is coming out and out protecting front, yep. what's the going on. The other cool off. thing about most of these torches is that they're flexible. So if I have a, an yeah. area where I need to get in and, and I can't quite get my hand in there the way I want, I can bend that torch that way 
or I can bend it this way, sure. or I can do whatever I need to be able to get at a, a, a location that I can't just get at with the torch in its normal straight mode like that. Sure. Let's pull up that graphic and we can just kind of look at an exploded view of a, of a TIG torch. Now the torch that we're talking about is what's called an air-cooled torch. Right. It's using just the ambient air to keep things nice and cool. Correct. Uh, there are other torches available, not so much needed for the thinner materials that we do, right. but if you're, if you're talking about you know, welding quarter inch plate Heavy or half inch stuff, plate, yeah. then you'd have to go to a torch that's water cooled. Right. And there's actually a water piping system. In, right, yeah, I would have uh, another hose coming up alongside. And a water, and pump, a water pump and, and a tank, tank and everything, and that actually circulates water around the, the tip of the torch yeah, to, keep to the torch maintain cool. it. Yep. But that's only, it's only needed for really heavy duty right, stuff. Right, yeah. yeah. Any, any aircraft welding you're going to do is going to be done with a small torch like we have here. Yeah. And it's, it's usually intermittent welding. You're not welding for long periods of time on a great big long weld. Yeah. It's you'll weld a cluster and then you move and weld another cluster. And sure. So it's on and off. So the torch has time to cool while you're welding, but also in between welds. Yeah. So uh, much like the gas, and let's just kind of focus on the torch for a moment. Uh -huh. Much like gas welding, we, okay, we have our our tip, mm -hmm. which is creating that electric arc, right. which is, this is kind of the flame if we yeah, relate exactly it back right. yep. to the gas welding, that's okay? Exactly right. And we still need filler material. Yep, you're still doing the same process. You have your, your torch creating your heat in one hand, yep. and you have your filler material in the other. So you're really- So are you gonna the, use the kind of the same geometry exactly, as far yep. as you're, you're pretty uh -huh. much gonna weld the same way you do with a gas torch. Okay. Except you're gonna just make the, make the heat with electricity. It's really okay. the only difference. And the other thing you're gonna do is you're gonna have a lot brighter light there. Yeah, tremendously. Even, even even much brighter. more brighter than the than the, the acetylene flame, so you're going to have to protect your eyes even more. Um, yeah. So, so we get to let's, use. Let's our talk helmet. about this. Yeah. Monster. So, the, <laughs> so this helmet uh, and these these can be used for uh, all kinds of welding, whether it's TIG or MIG, uh, yeah. uh, which is a different version of, of a wire feed welder. Sure. And of course, you got your stick arc like we talked about, and you're going to wear a helmet something like this for all of those processes. Yep. Uh, Traditionally, these helmets used to just have a glass lens in them yep. at a certain darkness, and there's different shading. Shading yeah. just like the other yeah. lenses, yeah. And you may have seen uh, a lot of the movies, where uh, World War II, where they're showing them building ships and stuff. You'll see the welder with the helmet tipped up. Yeah, flipping up, and flipping gets, down. And he gets and ready to weld. He'll flip his head like this, and it'll drop down in front of his face. And yeah. usually they've got it adjusted so it'll drop down, and he can actually see what he's doing sure. without having to use his hand to adjust it. Yeah. But it's still, you know, it might hit it right most of the time, but maybe not every time. And, yeah. and so it, it, it can be a little bit of a hassle. So yeah. the, uh, the, the marvels of modern technology have now given us uh, a light sensitive um, shield. Okay. So now when I, if I were to look through this with the helmet on, I would be able to see it's, it's slightly tinted, but you're basically looking through a clear sheet of glass. Yeah. So I can see, I can put the helmet down, have it on my face, and, and actually I can, see out. I can see to per, to you know position my torch and position my and get ready rod, to go. Get everything ready to go, and then when I strike my arc, there's a little photo cell in the bottom of this that picks up that bright light and instantly darkens the shield to the shade that I've set it, and it's adjustable. Uh, on the back here, you can see that there's some knobs. I can adjust the the, the darkness, the shade. Okay. I can adjust the reaction time, how fast or slow I want that reaction. Yep. And I can adjust the delay when it shuts off again. I, I stop my arc. When it goes back to and normal. It'll go back to clear, but I may not want that instantly. I might want that uh, you know a couple of second delay or something. And you sure. can adjust, all adjust, all that is adjustable on the back of your of your shield here. So you okay. can custom set it to exactly the shade you want and exactly the timing you want. Okay. And so now you just put your your helmet on, leave it right in front of your face, you yeah. got a nice big area to look out, get your torch all set up, strike your arc, instantly you've got a dark shield, you do your welding, you finish, and instantly you've got a clear shield again. Nice. So it's an amazing piece of technology, so very, one, very simple. Yeah, and one of the things I like about these now, especially, is the large area. You know, when you talked about looking at those 1940s little, guys, yeah. they had like a, little, a, a yeah. one inch yeah, wide right. little slit to look through. Not, e not even as large as these glasses. Yeah, are. but now you're a large area, yep. so you can see a lot more of what's going right. on. And of course you have the helmet protecting against heat and sparks and, that, and exactly. ultraviolet as well. Yep, yep. you don't get sunburned while yeah. you're welding, and which then, you can do. Right, and, and then finally, what's nice about these, and some of the other ones too, is that uh, for those of us that can't see very well anymore, <laughs> you can actually put little magnifying lenses in. Yes. So you could actually use this without your glasses right, if you want exactly. to, and it makes it a lot more comfortable. And that, that's a big deal for people like myself with old tired eyes. Yeah, right, me <laughs> um, too. Being able to see that well, because you are looking at, you know, you're fairly close to it and you want to see yeah. that detail, so you got to have nice clear vision to really make it nice. I, I use an optivizer a lot when yeah. I'm doing close-up work, exactly. and that really makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So we've, we've got our helmet on, we've struck our arc, we've got our 
filler rod, yeah. but how do we control the heat? Right. That's the key. Remember over here, we controlled the heat by the flow through the torch or by the torch size. Yeah. We're not changing the size of the torch here. We don't have different tips like we did in the gas. We just right. got our electrode. So how do we adjust that, that power, okay. if you will? We do that two ways. Number one, you have the range, uh, minimum maximum range that you set with your dial on the front of the machine. Okay. And it could be zero to 15 amps or zero to 30 or 20 to 30 or whatever yeah. you happen to set it for. And then to fine tune that, you typically use a foot pedal, which works okay. just like the accelerator pedal in your car. The further yeah. harder you push, the more the more flow you get with the electricity. So just if looking at the, at the front of this machine, okay, you basically have two little selecting buttons. Yep. Uh, and a dial. Yep. Now, TIG machines of old, and you've probably used these, mm -hmm. it was a huge panel about 50 different dials yeah, on it. Yeah, you had it. to you set to everything individually and figure out just exactly what settings you want. Sometimes you had to unplug certain things and plug yeah. them into a different, like an old switchboard operator. Yeah, used to exactly. Do like a telephone yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. But, so now they've made it much easier. Yep. They have pre selected the most common settings. Yep. You can still go in, like and some things, and fine tune the settings if you go into like a secondary menu and that kind of stuff. Right. But it gives you all you need right away. Right so, on, yeah. I mean, literally out of the box. You can be welding pretty to quickly, start it up, yep. but as you say, okay, you have the, essentially the big power knob here. Yep. So if you're doing say forty thousands uh, material, you might say you set know, it to forty amps. Well, yeah, like you, that, and again, you can look in your manual and it gives you guidance about approximately what you're going to want yeah. to weld certain thicknesses of material. Yeah. So that you set this as as what your max you're going to do, right. say forty. Yep. Okay. And now, as you say, now you have. The, the gas pedal. <laughs> zero, zero to 40 in yeah. X many seconds. <laughs> exactly. And so you're modulating the power by pushing on the gas pedal. Yep, exactly. You can you can throttle it up a little bit more to get more heat yeah. to get the weld started, and then you can gradually back it off as your joint gets hotter. You don't need quite as much heat because you've already built up some heat in your material, so you can you know kind of reduce it a little bit as you go. And, and again, technique to kind of get a feel for it. Yeah. Now there's another way to do that. Most of them will come if standard with the gas with the gas pedal, as I call it. Sure. The, the, but I like uh, to do it with my hand. Okay. Um, so you can get, uh, as a replacement for the gas pedal, you can get a little uh, controller that goes right on your torch. Oh, okay. And I've seen them both with knobs or with a slider so that you can go, you know, in, you, instead of zero to 40 with your foot, you can go zero to 40 with your finger. Right on the torch. Yeah, and that way, uh, and that works really good if you're not sitting at a bench welding. If you're, if you're upside if down. If you're laying under your feet or crawling around. Yeah. Uh, I like the hand one because you, you can, your feet can be anywhere and you don't need to worry about that. Yeah. You just find your comfortable welding position, get ready to go, and then you can just do it with your finger. Yep. So either way, um, both are optional generally. Sure. It'll typically come with the foot pedal and then you can buy the, the finger control as, a, as an add-on option. Okay. Okay. But it makes it a little bit handier. Uh, Personality-wise, I like it. If I was just going to sit at a bench all day and weld right in front of me, then of course the pedal works fine. Sure. But I like the, the hand control for aircraft welding because I end up in different positions and I just like to have it right there in my hand. Yeah. These are amazing machines. Oh, and you know, right. something like the Lincoln Electric uh, TIG welders they have now are just what you can do with them for the price is just mm -hmm. incredible. And we, we certainly appreciate Lincoln Electric and their support over the years of our TIG welding program. Very much we so. do have an EA Sport Air workshop on TIG welding, and we'll be scheduling some classes soon once we kind of figure out what's going on with this crazy situation we have. Right. But it, it makes it so much easier. Now, when we talk about electricity, okay, you have to have a connection. Right. Okay, so we have the torch, we have the part, but then we need some place for the electricity the, the, to go to. Yeah, you so, have to complete the circuit. So you have a clamp that you either put on the part, or I've seen some people use a metal table yep, you know, and then a clamp onto table. the table, and yeah. it completes the circuit right, that way. Yeah. yeah, you could, like if I was welding on a fuselage with this, I could clamp this at the tail post, yeah. and I could be welding at the, at the front of it, and the whole fuselage is going to carry that current Sure. So, you know, you normally you put it closer to where you're welding, but it yeah. would work that way just okay. fine. But you do have to but complete that, the circuit, completes the or circuit. you're not going to get an arc. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the other cool thing about both of these systems, but primarily the TIG, is that you can use multiple different uh, types of material to weld. You can weld aluminum. Yeah, so we haven't talked about that, yeah. all the different materials. And, and uh, there is, you know, you can weld aluminum with a gas torch. It's a little bit of a, an art, and I mean really an art form. I personally have not had much experience with it. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot of practice, but it can be done. Yeah. And, and there's people that can do just gorgeous welding with a There's gas some torch. masters that exactly. have done that, yeah. But. The advent of the TIG torch has made aluminum welding a lot easier for us. Okay. Um, for uh, steel welding, we use direct current. Okay. 
but for aluminum welding, we're using alternating current, and you oh. can set the machine to do. So you can s so you essentially do. set it for the material. Right. So we have steel, we have aluminum, aluminum whatever it might right. be. Right, yeah. and then we're setting the machine to do that. Uh, aluminum, as uh, just in, in watching mm -hmm. the people taking our course. It's a lot more challenging. It is, yeah. Uh, and the, the first thing about it is that when you, when I start a bead on this metal here and I get the two parts hot, yeah. and the, the metal goes to a molten state where you call your puddle, with steel, it automatically all flows together in a nice big puddle. Okay. The aluminum won't do that. The aluminum will bubble up and be hot and molten, but they won't, it won't join itself unless you force it to do with your oh, filler rod. Okay. So the first thing you have to do is learn to get it hot enough to get it melted, but get that filler rod in there and get your puddle started kind of before, it up. before it melts away to nothing and sure. you've got a bigger problem than what you started out with. <laughs> so so it's it got a little technique there, and then of course the, the speed that you're using and the type of filler rod you're using and that is a little bit different. Sure. So it's, it's going to take some practice, but it certainly can be done and it's far easier with the TIG machine, TIG machine than, than, than it was that. with the gas. So we can, we can do a, uh, steel, we can do aluminum. Uh, people are, you know, thinking about doing like aluminum fuel tanks and, yes. and maybe doing like a shaped cowling or a wheel pan. Yeah, uh, if you look at the, you know, in the old artisans that built the gorgeous wheel pants on many of the antique aircraft that you see out in the field, yeah. those were all done with oxyacetylene. Those guys were true artists. Yeah. They, those giant wheel pants on like a Stinson Gullwing or something, those yeah. aren't one sheet of, of, of It's metal. a whole bunch of little it's pieces It's a bunch of other pieces together. all welded together and then they smooth the welds off so you can't even see them and then yeah. they paint it and it looks like one just one. gorgeously shaped piece of metal, sure. but it actually was put together with different parts yep. shaped properly to make that wheel. Pad. I remember there was a, a, a really nice in-depth article on that in Sport Aviation. Yes. So check that out if you have a chance to look at the archives. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, and, and the other place they do that not so much wheel pants anymore because most people are using fiberglass or other composites, yeah. but some people like to make metal fairings like uh, the joint between their wing and their fuselage sure. or the tail and the fuselage, yeah. and you can do that with fiberglass too. But some people like to make those out of aluminum and uh, your your TIG welder to weld some allows uh, you to do that. Yeah, it makes it easier than trying to just hand form one sheet of aluminum into that very complex shape yep. that you would have to do that type of a of a filler. So there's another common material besides steel and aluminum that we use in aircraft building, and that's stainless steel. Right. Can we weld stainless steel with a TIG machine? Absolutely. Uh, again, it's going to be a different filler rod, and it's going to be a little different technique, but. Uh, if you look at all your stainless steel exhaust pipes that you buy for right. aircraft nowadays, those are all welded primarily with TIG with machines. With TIG machines. Yeah. So you could do that if Absolutely. you wanted to do yeah. a custom exhaust yep. system. Because some and people do, they want to route yeah, they the exhaust route a, a little bit differently. Way, or they yeah. want a muffler in a certain place where they can't purchase a system that, that meets their needs. Or they have to repair. Or they have to repair. Because exhaust systems tend to crack. Yes, they do. Once in a while, right? <laughs> Every once in a while, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and so stainless steel is another uh, medium where you could weld that with your with your TIG machine. So very versatile that Very way. versatile, yeah. Yep. Again, a little bit more investment. Uh, the machines, you know, between the two, between, between the two. gas welding and TIG welding, so it costs more. Yeah, costs more. Uh, and so there, that brings back my point earlier that I talked about, where maybe this is something that uh, a chapter might have in their tool crib. Yeah. Or maybe just one of the builders has, uh, uh, maybe they own a machine shop, or maybe they bought one for themselves and they're done with their project. Yep. And they might be able to lend it to other builders or share it with other builders within the chapter. Sure. And that's a great thing about our, our EA chapter network and our EA family is that there's lots of opportunities to do that with specialty tools that every individual doesn't necessarily need one in their garage all the time. Yeah. But they might need one for a particular part of their project that they're working on. Well, case in point is like our local EA chapter here in Oshkosh, EA chapter 252 has a TIG welding machine. Yep. And they actually have classes occasionally where some of the members who are more skilled in TIG welding will actually, you know, gather in a group and then teach folks how to TIG yeah. weld. Yeah, give them a little uh, introductory course so that they can understand that it's really not all that magical. It's it's just a matter of pr practice and yeah. technique. So. And the machine is there for other members right, of the for chapter members to, of chapter use, to yeah. use. If they're well, actually, and, and the chapter has a chapter project here in town is building a replica of Steve, Steve Whitman's Buster oh, yes. eraser. Yeah. And of course, they're using the, the machine to do the welding. They do all the that. welding so, on the on the fuselage. Yeah, so lots of different things going on there, and, mm -hmm. and there's lots of ways that you can share this uh, equipment and not have to pr everybody each individually purchase one. Sure. So gas welding, traditional. 
somewhat low entry level cost. I mean, mm. you're, you're paying for, of course, a torch and regulators. regulators you got to rent the cylinders or, or maybe buy them yeah, and refill or lease them or whatever. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's one way to go. TIG welding, you have a, a, a machine that you have to purchase. Yeah. The, the torch and thing is probably about the same pricing. Yeah, and, it, and typically it'll come with the machine. You won't, yeah. you won't buy them separately because it's going to be a, like a package deal that you purchase. Yeah, or and then you, and if you want to buy a different torch, yep. you know, if yep. you want to get a torch that's a different configuration, different size or right. shape, you, yep. can, you can add that on. Yep. Doing that thumb wheel controller if you want to. Right, and of course so, you have to get your uh, argon cylinder, which again, you can yeah. buy, you can lease or rent those, or you can purchase one. Yeah, any local one. gas supplier. And they've, they've got those. different sizes. If you're going to just do a little bit of welding, you need a smaller Get a smaller one. cylinder, well, they've got yeah. great big tall ones if you're going to you know, really get into it and do a lot of welding. So. Do you think one's easier over the other? Is there advantages, disadvantages I to take welding I don't versus find, gas? I don't find one being, some people will. I personally have done <laughs> both, and I don't find one necessarily to be easier necessarily, especially if you're just starting out learning it from scratch. It's just yeah. another skill to learn. Sure. Um, but I did find that um, if once you've got one kind of mastered or at least real comfortable with one, it's not that hard to switch to, to flip the other. over. Because again, you're, you're still using a torch in one hand, a filler rod in the other, so yeah. the technique is somewhat similar. And it really comes down a lot to that technique. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're setting things on the gas machine, uh, on the gas rig, yeah. and you're setting things on the TIG machine, right. but it comes down to heating the metal. Melting the metal. Yeah, melting the metal. Adding filler yeah. and then moving things around, yep. and, and then moving, yeah, and, and, and the, not being too hot or not being the technique. Too the, the whole technique cold. is the timing. That's yeah. really what you're learning. You know, we know we know how to make an arc. Everybody can do that, and we know how to. You know, we kind of got the idea of what we're doing with filler rod, but the, sure. the technique part of it is just the timing. I make my arc. I put my filler rod in there. How fast do I need to go to get the proper weld? Mm -hmm. So it's all about practicing just that timing. Yeah. So it sounds like in, in that respect, you know, it, it really comes down to the operator mm -hmm. and how they handle the right. heat, not necessarily the torch, but how they handle the, the heat. heat. Yeah, it's and, all about and, controlling the heat. And then adding adding filler to that. To, so so it, yep. it sounds pretty basic. Yeah, it's not bad. And, and again, uh, when you're first starting out, we uh, highly encourage you to use the technical counselor program. Uh, got a, a technical counselor in your chapter that's done some welding, and, and that person can come and critique your uh, initial practice welds and yep. maybe give you some hints and techniques that they might want to try to, to improve your, your process. Yeah. Finally, you'll get comfortable enough with it by welding some practice welds that you'll be ready to get on go that into motor it. mount or fuselage or whatever it is that you're welding yep. up, and you'll be comfortable to, to do that. So the EA Technical Counselor Program, of course, is an EA membership benefit where you can connect with folks that have built airplanes. Yep. You can look them up on our website, and uh, they're mentors kind of looking over your shoulder. They're not going to build it for you, no. but they're going to offer a useful uh, advice and constructive criticism yep. and yep. and, uh, help and, they might, and they might give you they might give you uh, some idea on how to do something that you just never really thought of you know? well just like you and I talking back and forth you know I could do this but when we're talking we, we start thinking about other things right. and it just expanding just having the that conversation. conversation having that conversation just gets your mind working exactly. and gets you to see other options you might not have thought of on your own sure so, so tech counselors are really important yeah. uh, and other members of the chapter as well yeah. you might have other builders that uh, you know maybe built a, a steel tube fuselage or something and you know certainly draw on their experience yeah. to to get their input as well sure. a and p mechanics in the area they really don't te teach as much welding in a and p school anymore i don't think they do at all yeah like i don't know the a and p school i mean they might just touch on it yeah. or show some videos yeah exactly beyond, so i mean it's it's got, that's kind of a lost art like fabric covering too. right exactly uh, that's kind of gone the way of antiquity <laughs> yes yeah. and that's why which we're here why we mean, keep, which why we keep it alive here at eaa yeah because aircraft restoration and 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 you know, aircraft restoration. When you think about that, you think about antique, vintage airplanes. But yeah. there's enough, there's home builds out there that are old enough that they're getting restored now too. So <laughs> it, you know, it's like a second generation. That's right. It's hard to think of a Vans aircraft as an antique, but, but it's pretty soon. Some of those, are, some of those have been around for 25 or That's more right. years. So. So there's some other great resources too, uh, besides your EA chapter and EA technical counselors. Uh, we mentioned the uh, hints for home builders. Yes. Over 500 videos on the web that you can right. uh, on demand look at and there's some great videos on gas welding and on TIG welding techniques. We also have some great books on gas welding and on, for both paths, yep. gas welding and TIG welding, we have a really nice DVD video series on the techniques of gas welding steel and TIG welding steel too. And then finally we have our EA Sport Air Workshops, an EA Sport Air Workshop on TIG welding here in Oshkosh and an EA gas welding workshop that we offer an Oshkosh as well, mm -hmm. but also take that on the road. Right. 
So there's a lot of great resources. You're not alone. And, and as we've been kind of hammering in on throughout the week here at EA Together is that at first these things seem really, really hard. Yep. But when you break them down to the basic aspects of it, Right. This stuff isn't that hard at no, all. No, it's really easy to do. Anyone can do anyone, it. I mean, anyone, yeah, anyone can do anyone this. Anyone can do the, any of these that we've, you know, we've talked about welding today. We've talked about in the, the last few days, we've talked about sheet metal and we've talked about fabric work and woodwork and it's all really basic skills that anybody can master if they just take a little bit of time. It really is. It's, it's, it's really, really simple. Yeah. Great. Well, we'll be back later this afternoon as we conclude our EA Together series on workshop techniques here at the uh, Spirit of Aviation Week, uh, live from Oshkosh, talking about sheet metal. Until then, I'm Mark Force. And I'm Joe Norris. We'll see you later on. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching today.